Hello, BookTube. I have some mail for you <laughs> on a Sunday after an eventful 24 hours. Some of you may have seen the news that Boston broke all sorts of records for a cold. It became, uh, on Friday, it became very, very cold, and then it became unearthly, just unbelievable, seriously, quickly, dangerously cold for Friday night. Saturday, it was negative 10, negative 15, negative 20, below zero Fahrenheit, which is pretty bad. <laughs> this is pretty bad for this neck of the woods in this in this day and age. Pretty bad. And it uh, it had a predictable effect. It froze the pipes here at Hyde Cottage, so there was no running water. And uh, the pipes are fairly new, and they are progressive. They are thick white plastic, so not metal. Uh, which means that, theoretically, no matter what, they won't burst, which is the real nightmare. It's bad enough that you're, if your pipes freeze when it's really cold, but it's worse if they burst. Because then you've got, uh, you're going to be without water for a week, at least. You're going to have to get a team of workers in and everything. These things, I don't think, they, I was told they aren't, they aren't, they aren't going to do that. But, and I was also told they won't freeze. <laughs> but I don't think anybody was thinking of negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That did it. Uh, so we were without water for a while, and then it, the minute the temperature went up, the temperature is going to go up for the next five days. So the minute it went up, give those pipes credit. They they couldn't handle negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but they could, hear, they could handle 2 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Fahrenheit. They could handle that. So the water came back, and the temperatures have been going up, which is great. Don't have to wear my devil's hat in the house anymore. Don't have to worry about being outside with the bean. I did. Friday night, we could not have stayed out more than five minutes without seriously hurting ourselves. Now, a light sweater is all that's necessary. Not even a winter coat. No hat, no gloves, no nothing. Isn't that right, baby? Huh? It was wonderful, wasn't it? <laughs> we encountered a pug on our latest walk. We encountered an adorable black pug who did not know what to make of Frida. She was stiff and she yelled at him and she was ordering him to you know, stand still. I'm sniffing you. Don't do anything. Well, <laughs> her usual, her usual approach. She's not aggressive. The owner knew that right away. The owner could see that right away. And the pug noticed that right away because he made a dart for me. I squat right down to dog level. I don't, I don't, I don't greet the dogs by, you know, glooming over them like that. I squatted right down to dog level, and it, he made a lunge for me, you know, because he wanted to smooch me, and she, Frida went crazy. What are you doing? How dare you? Stop moving. I haven't finished sniffing you. And for a second, the little boy thought, ooh, is she defending territory? And I said to him, no, 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 ignore her. Come here and kiss me. <laughs> Come here and smooch with me. And it was a wonderful, a wonderful encounter. The, the owners, the pug owners were very amused by how fussy Frida is. She was, she was making friends, but she was fussy about it. <laughs> but anyway, we have some mail. Uh, unfortunately, no package opening, but maybe that's just as well. <laughs> so we have a, a periodical and a couple of books. And I want to show them to you. And one of the books is not mail. So this is full of paradoxes. <laughs> the periodical is Men's Health, which I still get. I haven't written them a check and I don't know how long. And I, I brought this up. I, I was confused about I always am confused about this. And a friend of mine said, well, don't you hold up every one of their issues in front of a thousand people every month? It's unlikely they're going to they're gonna cancel your subscription. I don't think that's the reason. I don't think any, anybody at Men's Health knows anything about me. But this is a kind of a dude bro magazine it, it I, in its own defense the science it's so there's always lots of science in it and a lot of times the science is not bro science if you've ever watched i don't advise it but if you've ever watched youtube bro health channels or especially the weightlifting channels they will be just confidently reeling off things about adenosine triphosphate or whatever they don't have any idea what they're talking about it's bro science they, they're making it up as they go along they're pulling it out of their extremely sculpted took us <laughs> And Men's Health, bless them, doesn't always do that. And every once in a while, there's something interesting in them. And there were a couple of things in here that interested me that I thought I would, I thought I would share with you. Uh, like, for instance, there was an article about uh, faux protein, fotein, uh, artificial simulated chicken and pork and whatnot, and uh, things to look for, advances that have been made. And I, I, the article is very good. I'm hoping that it changes minds. I don't think that men's health reading audience will have their minds changed on this channel, on this subject. But you look at that. Those people right there should not have to die in torment in or, just because you like the taste of their meat, especially if you have 
a, a substitute. And increasingly, you do. There's a booming market in Fotein. Uh, but there was also, there's an article here by David Ferry, not the David Ferry, I'm assuming, called Toxic Dump. It was a great visual there. And it's about all of the toxic chemicals that we take into our body on a daily basis. How prolific they are and uh, what you can do about it. And so, with some, some fairly simple advice. Uh, for instance, uh, use normal cleaning agents, baking soda, or vinegar, buy organic as much as possible. Uh, also, your drinking water should be filtered. Even if you live in, an, in a town or that has relatively good tap water system, unless you're lucky enough to live, like for instance, uh, Mark Richardson up at the very old house in Vermont, they have their own well. You're never going to have better water than that. But if you're on a, a, a system, interconnected water pipes, uh, then you should, even if your, your, your municipal steps are good, you should still filter that water. And there's a whole bunch of options from the, the pitchers that filter to the filter that you screw onto the faucet and a whole bunch of others. I thought the article was really, really good. And there was another article in here that I liked as well. I didn't expect it in Men's Health because it runs counter to what a lot of their core subscriber group actually pays attention to, and that is life advice. Everybody has life advice, especially all of those BroTube channels, the ones that, the fitness advisors and the, the weightlifters, they're always coming out with life advice. It's unbelievable to me. The foremost offender on a number of different levels is a channel by a, a guy named Greg O'Gallagher called Kino Body. He, he has been hawking drugs. He's been hawking his his Kino Octane, you know, gray market, North Korean amphetamine pre-workout. It's, it's swill. He has no idea what's in it. He acts like he does. His fans don't care what's in it because they want to look like him. It's the usual shuck and jive. It's the usual con. And he has built an empire on it. He's an independently wealthy young liar for it. And uh, he is taken to, to giving out Andrew Tate style life and dating advice. That's utterly ridiculous. It's so it's so repulsive. Uh, he's the foremost offender, but there are plenty of others. I swear. You no sooner need, you no sooner have fifty thousand YouTube subscribers and a pair of decent pecs than you're starting to sound like some sort of cod liver Aristotle. That's <laughs> just embarrassing. Uh, and the the readership of this magazine eats that stuff up. They absolutely love the. You know the faux stoicism, or the the you know uh, lions eat lambs, or whatever, or metal sharpens metal, or whatever, whatever the crap is that these people are saying, they, or, or they all love it. So an article, there's an article here about how to survive too much advice. Is pretty interesting. I wasn't expecting it at all. And the article uh, should, does it have a writer. It might not have a writer. Milan Polk. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping that's a pseudonym. Uh, the, the, uh, the article gives advice on how to assess your advice giver. So it doesn't run down the advice. It runs down the source of your advice. I thought that was really refreshing. And, and it has, as you'll see, a broader implication. There's a broader implication in some of these. Uh, question number one to ask about your advice giver is, did they earn their credibility? Uh, question number two is, do they have an ulterior motive? their advice. That's nothing to do with your well-being. Uh, question number three is, would you actually follow their advice? Uh, and question number four is, is this even real? And question number five is, what do other experts think? And the reason that I like these things is because they apply to anything. I automatically thought about them in, in context of myself, uh, in terms of book reviews. These things apply. The only element that's missing here, the one that I would add is, is the advice, does the advice work? Which it might be encompassed under, is it even real? But I think isn't even real is looking for, is the advice giver lying to you? <laughs> is, is the advice giver, is the advice based on nothing at all? Is like, for instance, if we stick to YouTube bro to fitness channels, they talk about bulking and cutting. They talk about, you know, sensible meal prep and whatnot. They all smoke. That's how they keep their weight off. They don't do, they don't keep their weight off by controlling their impulse eating. They do it by taking in carcinogens, and they take in a lot of carcinogens, a lot of them. And on alternate channels or on OnlyFans or the, the, patron, the highest patronage level, they openly admit it. They revel in it 
because there is no way for you to be a Kino body style fitness advisor without buying into the manosphere, without buying into that whole world of what real men are like. So uh, Kino body is the only exception. He's the only one that doesn't have a, a beard. You have to have a beard. You have to have a trophy wife, or he at least treats women like, like trashy disposable objects. You know, as far as I know, he's never revealed on his channel that he has just one. But you have to have a, a, a trophy wife who's only there because of what she looks like. You might hate her. She's not allowed to have her own social media, so she can't compete with you. And another one, another key element of that world, of that manosphere world, is the absolute totemization of cigars. You can't be in that world without it. You just can't be. And so that on their channel, when they say, you know, watch your meals, don't impulse eat, you got to cut that fat, you got to be in a caloric deficit, all that, the only reason they're able to do it is because they take in carcinogens 30 times a day. Do you want to do that? You shouldn't, if you do. So in that sense, they aren't real. They are lying. I have seen fitness influencers, bro tube influencers, they only do weightlifting. They don't do anything else. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason they don't do anything anaerobic. And it's not because they're concentrating on weightlifting. It's because they can't do anaerobic. They're tobacco addicts and have been since they were 13. They don't have any lung capacity anymore to do anaerobics. They might dress it up however you like, but they couldn't run around a block. You could run around a block better than they could, even if they're lifting 500 pounds on, you know, horse steroids or whatever. Uh, they, I have seen some of them lie about that just directly, and it's always painful. It's always embarrassing. I look at it and I think, Granted, you have the receding hairline of a 50-year-old, but you're only 22. Are you? Do you really want to be on this path absolutely lying about everything for a tiny amount of money? Do you really want to do that? Do you not realize that you're going to be 70 someday and that you're going to look back on this and hate your, what you did? I've seen some of them play act that they just stopped running. So they will have the trophy wife spritz them, you know, like they were, like with our house plan. And then the, the camera will start as they go, <sighs> like they're running the last two steps of, of, of uh, you know, the Iron Man 100 meter dash or whatever that they did. They didn't do it. It's cheap theatrics. You only have to have a little time in theater to see it. They're not that good at pretending. And they'll say, hey guys, how's it going? So I got a deal on my pre. <laughs> so that definitely applies to, is it real? But these other questions are excellent. Has the person earned their credibility is an excellent question. If we look at book critics, have they spent time in the trenches? Have they done a lot of book reviewing? <laughs> you know, And have they earned their credibility in the sense of the other question that I'm asking specifically in, is when you take their advice, are you happy that you did? Are they good at what they do? It, does their advice work? Like, for instance, this question here, would you actually follow their advice? That sort of thing. Do they have an ulterior motive? Another excellent, excellent question. Of course, all the BroTube fitness people all have an ulterior motive. But unfortunately, it applies even in the book world. Right? <laughs> it doesn't really apply among my exact contemporaries, my exact counterparts. Professional or semi-professional mainstream book critics usually don't have an ulterior motive, usually not. But big BookTube channels are often sponsored by publishers. They're often sponsored by people who the sponsorship will end right quick if uh, <laughs> we didn't have any running water, so I'm doing double time on the laundry. But we, their sponsorship will end right away if they say this is only so-so or isn't any good at all. It's, they've sold their name. They've sold their accountability. So they definitely have an ulterior motive. You have to watch out for that. I think this is really good advice just in general. In the last place on earth I was expecting it. Uh, in terms of assessing not the quality of the advice, but the quality of the advice giver. That's terrific. Uh, now we have two books. <laughs> we have two books. And one of them was a package that was opened off camera by my surly houseboy, who was no doubt expecting that it was some of the porn. Uh, but he was mistaken. It was not his porn. It's close enough to being mine. At my age, this is about as close to porn as I get. This is a forthcoming book. This comes out in uh, June, late June. And it is Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth I, the mother and daughter who forever changed British history, by Tracy Borman, who a lot of you know and like. You, a lot of you like her work. I do, too. And this is as close to porn as I get. <laughs> it's, it's a dual biography. Let's see what we have here. Uh, 
Much of the fascination with Britain's legendary tutors centers around the drama surrounding Henry VIII and his six wives and Elizabeth I's rumored liaisons. Yet the most fascinating relationship in that historic era may well be that between mother and daughter who individually and collectively changed the course of British history. They didn't do it collectively, they didn't know each other. But I understand what the publicist means here. The future Queen Elizabeth was not yet free when her mother, Anne Boleyn, was beheaded in 1536 on Henry's order, incensed that she had not given him a son and tired of her contentious nature. There may have been another aspect involved, but those certainly played a part. Elizabeth had been raised away from court, rarely ever seeing Anne, and after her death, Henry tried in every way to erase Anne's presence and memory. In that moment in history, few could have predicted that mother and daughter would each leave enduring, interlocked legacies. Yet, as the author reveals in this first ever joint portrait, that's not true. Is it? Don't I remember a book from uh, the, I think the early 1960s? It might have been a novel. It might, this might be the first joint biography. Uh, both women broke the mold for British queens and for women in general at the time. Anne was instrumental in reforming and reshaping forever Britain's religious traditions, and her years wielding power over a male-dominated court provided an inspiring role model for Elizabeth's glittering and unprecedented 45-year reign. Indeed, Borman shows how much Elizabeth, most visibly by refusing to ever marry, but in many other more subtle ways, was influenced by her mother's legacy. Okay, well, late June. This is one of the latest books that I have. It's a long way off. I'm hoping to review it. Obviously, I will review it for Open Letters if I can't review it for anywhere else. But I'll twist a few arms and see who else will do it. And then the other book is not in the mail. It was, it was I was watching uh, Chris's channel. Uh, I, what is it? Books Unabridged? Unabridged Adventures? Something like that? I'll leave a link to the video. He was just doing a, a roundup of stuff that he's been reading. He's a big... Uh, Lee Child fan, big Jack Reacher fan. Fascinating to listen to when he does. Him and also, uh, well, there are a few channels that really like uh, the, the Reacher books. And uh, I'll leave a link to his video. I'm not doing it justice. Really, really good. Really entertaining to watch. And uh, at one point, he mentioned The Killing Floor, the first Jack Reacher novel. I think he mentioned it in connection with the latest TV adaptation with Alan Richardson as Jack Reacher. Uh, pretty good stuff. Pretty good TV. About as good an adaptation of that first story as you could ask for. And I, I loved the series. Uh, and when he when Chris mentioned the book, I thought, you know, I read the latest I've I read the latest Lee Child whenever he comes out with anything. It, it comes to me, so I read it. But I haven't reread the first Reacher novel in forever. And I really should. I really should go back and see, you know, I liked it. At the time I remember liking it. But uh I was out with the bean. We have not been able to go on long ground hugging walks for a few days now. It has been forbiddingly cold. Single digits or double digits below zero Fahrenheit. So we weren't, it's been pit stops only with no ground covering walks. And neither one of us likes that. Old as I am and, and much of an indoor dog as she is, we both like to go out and get a good wind up on a nice ground covering walk. We did that today. And we passed a little free library, and I found the first Jack Reacher book in one of these taller, what are these called, prestige paperbacks? I actually like them. I actually like the the uh, the feel of them in the hand. And this is the first Jack Reacher novel, which I read. This came out in the 90s? When did this come out? Uh, yeah, 1997. And I read this back then when it came out. It's a, it's a terrific, terrific opening because it does not lo overload you with anything. Uh, uh, Jack Reacher is a is a big ex military guy. He's very tall, very you know ominous, foreboding figure. It turns out he is, he is pure knight in shining armor, but nobody looks at him and thinks that. And he gets off a bus at, at eight in the morning in middle of nowhere Georgia, and walks down the country road from the highway. The bus driver stops on the highway to let him off, and uh, he he walks down a country road from that bus th that stop on the highway into town in the pouring rain so he's walking along that road for four hours in the pouring rain he gets to town goes to a diner orders a late breakfast and he's he's not even finished with it when the police roar up to the parking lot of that diner and he knows right away they're there for him there's no way that they would come arms guns drawn for anybody else for the two old guys in the in the diner so it's an indelible opening scene they arrest him 
they bring him to the to the precinct house and they they tell him that the night before someone was brutally murdered at a warehouse on that country road and that witnesses a witness saw a tall guy in a black coat with a bald head or a light light colored hair there at the moment and that's exactly what Reacher looks like he knows that he's innocent and he knows that his that his story about asking the bus driver to let him off when it's not a designated stop, he knows that it can be verified. His story can be verified. And he also knows that there's a killer out there. And he's interested in that because Jack Reacher goes, he doesn't have a home. He wanders around with just a toothbrush and a little bit, and a bank card, I guess. And he doesn't have a home. And what he does is wander around writing things, fixing things, solving mysteries, writing wrongs, that sort of thing. It's a weird bare bones premise. I remember when I read it thinking, Right, this this is done with a huge amount of conviction, and boy, oh boy, the narrative is terrific. Oh, in terms of readability, not a foot wrong. Not a foot wrong. I remember thinking that vividly when I first read this, that boy, oh boy, you won't have any trouble getting to the end of this thing, that's for sure. Also, in hindsight, I can look back on that opening, those opening chapters, and think, that is really well done. You don't tell us much about him. He, the, the, the cops in that town in nowhere, Georgia, don't know anything more about him than we do. We don't know anything more about him than they do. We're not sure he's innocent. He's telling us that he is. We get the feeling that he's probably a good guy. But the, the decision to, to take Reacher and strip away everything from him. Here's a character that he has a, a rich backstory, a violent backstory, but we don't need to know it. Because he doesn't have any present story. He doesn't have any fore story. <laughs> he doesn't live anywhere. He doesn't have any ID. Just wanders at, at random from place to place. By stripping that away, you really do bring certain narrative elements right to the fore. So uh, I'm going to read this again. <laughs> I'm going to read this now, 20 years after I read it the first time. And we will see. So those were the two books. We have Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth I, and we have Killing Floor, the first Jack Reacher novel. In paperback, which I just happened to find in a booktube coincidence, which I really like. I love booktube coincidences. So that's it. That's a little Sunday mail. Normal mail will resume tomorrow, I presume. Uh, now that the weather is normal again, uh, no more no more danger if you're near a window. No more need to bundle up when you're in your home. That's terrific. <laughs> that is terrific. You take that for granted until it goes away. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, booktube.